Welcome everybody. I see a lot of people coming in. We are so excited to have you join us. Welcome. If you want, I always love hearing where people are coming from. So open up that chat box. You should see it at the bottom of the little Zoom bar there in your window. And if you just type in your name um, and where you're coming from, if you're coming from a school, let us know what school you're coming from, um, from New York, New Jersey, PA, or maybe somewhere else. Um, let us know. We'd love to, to see where people are coming from today. Welcome. We're, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes before we get started um, to let people kind of um, come in. So welcome, everybody. All right, we've got some New Jersey, Denver. I'm assuming that's Denver, Colorado. Very exciting. And Claire's a school administrator. Oh, Judy's here. Hi, Judy. Going to be presenting with you guys in Bucks County next week. That's exciting. Indianapolis. Nice. We're getting some folks from the Midwest. Very exciting. Morris Hills, New Jersey, Long Island, Riverhead. This is great. Getting people from all over. Jackie, good grief intern, Princeton University. Very nice. Welcome. Chicago, strong Midwest contingency here. That's great. Morris County, <clears throat> Livingston, Bristol. Paul Breda, good grief newbie. Yeah, welcome, Paul. Excited that you're here. Bucks County. Nice, Morris County, Monmouth, Stuyvesant. Amanda, Justice Intern, awesome. That must be why it's bumping, nice. Welcome everybody. Again, we're just gonna give another minute or two before I kind of set things up and then hand it over to Jess. So welcome everybody. Connecticut State University, MSW student, nice. This is great, Tenafly. <clears throat> All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, keep that chat box open, because I'm gonna be paying attention to that throughout. So today I'm gonna be playing the role of moderator. And in a second here, I'm gonna hand it over um, to our presenter, um, Jessica Chalk Goldman. But before I do, I just wanna um, provide a couple of introductory notes. Um, welcome everybody to this webinar on suicide prevention and intervention for youth in the time of COVID-19. This is being brought to you by Good Grief Schools. I'm really excited to welcome um, our guest presenter, as already mentioned, um, Jessica Chalk Goldman, and I'll read her bio in a moment. But before I do, I wanna set up the webinar with a couple of housekeeping um, uh, things first. So as mentioned, this webinar is being brought to you by Good Grief. And for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a nonprofit organization based in New Jersey whose mission is to build resilience in children, strengthen families, and empower communities to grow from loss and adversity. Our Good Grief Schools program is a comprehensive approach to addressing loss and adversity within the school setting through social emotional learning, grief support groups, professional development, and parent education. And we try to put on webinars and continuing education opportunities like this one. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about us or um, our programs, um, I'm gonna type this into the chat. You're welcome to visit it. Our website is good-grief.org. Um, second, um, this webinar today is being recorded. Um, so we just wanna make you aware of that so that we can make it available to people, to people after um, the live session is complete. It might take us a week or so to get it uploaded, but know that it will be shared and that you can share it um, with your colleagues. But on that note, uh, while we are recording this session, we ask that you be mindful of not repurposing the recording or replicating Jess's content without prior consent. Um, Jess is an excellent presenter and has a lot to share and is very interested in doing so. So if you are interested in having this presentation done to your school or faculty or organization, just reach out to Jess. I'm sure Jess is gonna share her contact info or if you're interested in any of the presentations we've done with Good Group, just reach out directly to me and I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, on a final note, I will be sending out a blank certificate following this session that you can put in your info, um, noting that you attended. So be on the lookout for that tomorrow. Um, and with that, I am going to introduce our speaker. 
Uh, Jessica Chuck Goldman is the school social worker at Stuyvesant High School. Uh, she's currently a doctoral candidate at NYU School of Social Work, focusing on restructuring how mental health and suicidal ideation are addressed within the Department of Education. Um, she's a guest lecturer at NYU School of Social Work, the Lehman College School of Social Work, uh, and a member of the uh, DOE um, Guidance Leadership Committee, working with school social workers and school counselors to address racism and oppression in the Department of Education. Uh, Ms. Chuck Goldman also started the first peer-to-peer -peer support group um, for school clinicians, providing peer supervision regarding the rise of suicidal ideation, self-harm, and drug use in middle and high schools. Um, she has two years of advanced clinical training at the Ackerman Institute for the Family, uh, and is the advisor to the Stuyvesant's LGBTQ club. Jess, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, hi, everyone. I am really excited that you're all here for this presentation. And what I like to say before I go into the details of suicide prevention and intervention is that this is, um, it's a very hopeful presentation. It's a very hopeful kind of work that we do um, with prevention and intervention because we save lives. So I hope that you can keep that um, in your mind as we go through the details because some of this is hard, but um, again, there is always that idea of hope with this. Um, I'm gonna go through some details and um, please ask questions and then we're gonna pause midway for questions and then at the end do questions. Thank you. My mom works as a health aide. It's just me and my brother at home. I left and went to the Brooklyn Bridge and stood there wanting to jump because I'm thinking nonstop that my mom is going to die. I don't want to be the only one in charge of my younger brother. This is one of my senior males um, in the spring. I took the pills because I feel like I'm the only one here who gets depressed and my friends don't understand. They're all talking to each other all day long and I'm here stuck alone with my parents. This is from a colleague who is in a middle school and dealing with a suicidal eighth grade girl. I told my mom that she and I need therapy to stop fighting because our apartment is small and she hangs over me all day long. She says, people don't need therapy. We need to focus on school, family, and jobs. I feel like she doesn't hear me, so I just want to jump out of my window. Um, this is a junior female that I was dealing with this school year. Um, I like to bring this in to the conversation before we get started. Um, and it's for many clinicians, um, especially in schools of social work, we talk a lot about cultural competency. Um, we are now moving to a concept called cultural humility. Um, cultural competency, it's a little passe, what it is is this idea you can read about different ethnicities and cultures and therefore you're an expert and can work with many different ethnicities and cultures. Really what we're finding is um, you need as a practitioner to really learn the individual story of each child and family you're working with. Um, I'm a white clinician and I work mostly with communities of color and so this is something that I bring into my regular practice. Um, so just some quotes on cultural humility and we could do a whole training on just this concept but I'm going to rush through it. Um, it's the concept of being able to really understand that um, when you're working with a person with another uh, with another ethnicity. You really have to understand that the cultural identity, what's important to them and their specific story is what is brought into the clinical work that you do with them. So you really need to constantly honor those differences. Um, even if you have a shared ethnicity with your client, you need to hear their individual story. So I just want you to keep this idea in your head as we move through this. Um, and I bring this up, I work specifically in the New York City school system. I know we have people and I love that we have people throughout the country here. Um, but I just want to talk about the demographics of the New York City school system and how understanding where you're working is vital to the kind of work that you bring to the kids and the families. Um, New York is very diverse. It's 40.5% Latinx, 26% Black, 16% Asian, and 15% White in the public school system. Um, 
So here are some norms of the different ethnicities that we work with in the school system. With Latina youth, this is actually one of the um, populations that has some of the highest suicidal ideation and risk for suicide attempts. Um, we are finding, research is finding, that their attempts are far greater than their non-Latino, uh, non-Hispanic counterparts in New York City. Um, and 10.5% of the Latina adolescents have made a suicide attempt. Um, with young black children, um, what we're finding of the younger population is that it's actually exceeding that of white children with suicide attempts. More than a third of elementary school uh, suicides involve black children. Um, Michael Lindsay, who is a phenomenal leader um, in this work at NYU, um, is leading this, and I recommend everyone to look into his work because it's really incredible about honing into that population. Um, and one of the important things to understand in working with the different populations that we work with is that emotions are presented in different ways depending on the population, your fam how they're expressed. So you will find that, um, you know, one study found that young black boys, for example, who are depressed may express this as anger and aggression, but really, it's underlying depression that may bring the kids to this place of anger and aggression. And what we find in our school systems is often these kids are suspended, um, reprimanded, whereas we're not really dealing with the underlying mental health issues. I go through these communities and I'm gonna keep moving forward um, because we as clinicians cannot be experts in every single community. And I know in New York City at least, we have one of the most diverse school systems and one of the most segregated school systems. So I personally work in um, a majority Asian American population. And when I worked in another school, it was a Dominican population. And so it's knowing the population you're working with. Um, with Asian American youth, there are many cultural pressures to succeed. And what they found is that because of these pressures, um, the suicidal ideation in this population was actually higher than the general population. LGBTQ youth, um, this is a very, another very high risk population. Um, they have been thought to contemplate suicide and have ideation three times higher the rate than heterosexual youth. Um, they have attempts that are five times higher. And with transgender adults, 40% um, of them have made suicide attempts. And what they have found is that 92% of those 40% happened before the age of 25. So these are kind of some red flags of certain populations that I ask that you be very mindful of when you're working with, to know that these are a little higher risk. Um, but again, and I'm going to go through the normalizing of this, with every student you're working with, these are conversations you should be having. Um, suicide is the leading cause of death, um, excuse me, the second leading cause of death in the age range of schools that we're working in. Um, I don't do a lot of work with elementary schools. Um, I do middle and high school, so that is not something I am as familiar with. And I apologize if you're elementary school and I recommend looking up literature specific to that. Um, but it is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds and 15 to 24 year olds. Um, it's horrific that that is the second leading cause of death. Um, one in six adolescents has reported serious suicidal ideation in the past year. I want every person who works in a school right now to think of six kids who they work with. One of them has had serious, not just fleeting thoughts, serious suicidal ideation in the past year. Here's where the hopeful part comes in though. Um, suicidal ideation and attempts are more common than completed suicides, which means the interventions work. Um, going in there, doing the concrete work, asking the questions does save lives. So we are going to figure out a way to normalize that into our everyday practice with the kids that come to our offices. And we 
will become familiar in a way that will end up saving his lives. Um, so why you came to the training. We are here to talk about suicidality during COVID-19. Um, suicidality and suicidal ideation is something that we in schools deal with all the time. And I don't know about other clinicians in schools. Um, well, I know about the ones I've spoken with, but we are dealing with an uptick, um, not of completed suicides, but of thoughts of suicides, major depression, needs for hospitalization, needs for partial hospitalizations. Um, there's not much literature out there yet as to why. I'm writing a paper right now and trying to pull out some studies. Um, most people are just doing literature reviews and looking at, you know, uh, having interviews with doctors, but you know we don't have studies yet of this because we're, we're still in the pandemic. Um, but in New York State, what we found is that um, the first few weeks after COVID started, the numbers really dropped. And I know for me as a school clinician, I work in the largest high school in Manhattan. We have 3,400 kids. I'm the only clinician for the 3,400 kids, so I tend to deal only with crisis. Um, and lots of referrals, but not the clinical long-term work. Um, it was a little shocking to me in March when the numbers dropped, because I'm used to sending about one kid a week uh, to the hospital to be evaluated. Um, we were not sending anyone. Come June, everything changed. And my interpretation as to why it changed, um, it could differ depending on where you're working in schools. But there was a feeling that kids have of summer, of hope, of things to kind of turn around and you know have fun and relax and not worry about school. And we were still stuck inside. Um, all the summer programs were stopped. All the classes were still remote if they were doing online classes. Um, kids were not really seeing their friend and friends. And this, this, sense of hopelessness increased the numbers. I was sending kids, some weeks I was sending two, three kids a day to be evaluated in the hospital. It, it was shocking to me um, that this was happening. Um, we went through and are going through, but I think especially in the beginning of COVID, we went through a community trauma. Um, in New York City, I know I was in Brooklyn in the first few months and just hearing the ambulances go by over and over throughout the night, um, the not sleeping. Um, what psychiatrists were finding is uh, many kids um, had parents who were coming into the hospital who, like the first student I spoke about, parents who were unemployed, um, who lost their jobs, parents who died. Um, so much of the isolation, and then the community trauma that kids were going through, just knowing that so many people were dying, even if it wasn't in their immediate family, everyone knew of someone who was either very sick or had passed. So the mental health implications are difficult for kids. Um, they're difficult for adults, but they're especially difficult for kids because, um, you know, it's a, it's a different language for them. It's a different, thing to process this kind of trauma. Um, they worried, a lot of kids were worried about the health of their families, the work, were their fa families gonna remain employed? Um, also the idea of death um, is very difficult. And then um, separation from friends. Uh, I like to think of teenagers as um, kind of like two-year-olds, two they walk away from you, they say, no, 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 they don't wanna listen to you, they wanna just be out there in the world. What we were finding with these teenagers is that they were stuck at home, the people that they were interacting with were just their families, and it's the time they're supposed to be separating from their parents. And kids were having a difficult time with this, and what they were doing was they were really withdrawing, um, they weren't showing up to therapy. You know, this was a lot of isolation and the isolation had um, repercussions. Um, so again, the loneliness, um, you know, the home is supposed to be a place 
that is the arbor of safety, not for all, because again, we have many kids who have you know, abuse in the home and we saw a major rise of abuse and ACS cases that happened and domestic violence. Um, but the home then became a source of stress and this is where the ideation increased. Um, so why do we need prevention in schools? Um, we need prevention in schools because again, ideation planning attempts are much more common than suicide and schools are an essential environment in which to identify, respond to the risk. Um, they spend more waking hours in school than any other place, including home. And again, all of that changed during COVID. Um, for me as a clinician, I found this to be incredibly difficult and I didn't know how to handle this. Um, and I think this is something we all as clinicians were facing and we are still facing. Um, I have some clear answers on how to handle this and address this. And I also am working through this and trying to figure it out day by day because things are changing day by day. Um, so these are some of the questions that came up for me. How do we know when kids are at risk when we can't be around them to assess them? Um, we're used to having kids in the hallway either, you know, expressing, you know, some feelings of sadness, anxiety, suicidal ideation in front of us or their friends coming to us and telling them, telling us that this is happening. Or we have a kid who's not showing up to classes and the teachers reach out to us. It's much harder to determine which kids are not showing up to classes because um, they have ideation or just because they're done with school. You know, we have so many kids who are withdrawn from school. I know across the board, not just in the school I'm working. Um, so again, how do we assess risk when we're not around the kids? Do we do this over the phone? Um, do we do this um, on Google Meets? What happens again if they're not engaging, not showing up? Um, and then the other thing, and I think this is really, really important, and I'm gonna get to this. Um, there's a lot of shame affiliated with parents in certain cultures um, having to do with mental health, with suicidality. Um, what happens if parents aren't sharing with us that these kids are having ideation? Um, so these are the big issues that are coming up for clinicians, for me, and I assume more. Um, this tends to be a section that I spend a lot of time on, but we have only an hour for this training, so I can't go into as much detail as I would like, but um, a lot of studies have found that non-white adolescents are less likely to express ideation than their white peers. Um, and what these studies have found is that they're called hidden ideations. Um, you can come to other trainings I do that are longer, but I will say that um, clinicians know their populations. You know how the kids in your populations are expressing their ideations for the populations I work with, which is mostly Asian American. Um, we find a lot of the ideation is expressed either in English papers or in texts to friends um, or writing things on um, social media rather than verbal expression. Um, know your population, do some research on your population on how they tend to express. I went through with young, um, with the younger black population about sometimes it comes out, again, these are generalizations, but the studies have found sometimes it comes out as aggression, whereas really it is insecurity, depression, um, anxiety. So it's just knowing the expression that's very different. Okay, this is going to be the most important thing I say this whole training. So take a picture of this, take, you know, memorize this. Asking a child if they're having thoughts about suicide does not make them more suicidal. Um, I know when I was growing up in New York, um, I went to a New York City school um, in the 90s. We didn't talk about suicide. Um, I, I just, it, it wasn't, it, 
she was, you know, we, A, we didn't have social media, but TV shows weren't about suicide. It just wasn't in the open. We are in such a different world. Um, 13 Reasons Why came out. And I know after that happened, we had so many hospitalizations at our school because of kids saying that they felt like Hannah from 13 Reasons Why. Um, there are multiple books about it. There are cartoons. Kids throw around saying, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself because I got a bad grade, or oh, he broke up with me, I'm going to kill myself. It's just in their language. Um, but what studies have found is that it's in the kids' language, but it is not in our language as clinicians. So we need to normalize that we are allowed to be asking kids if they're having thoughts of suicide. Assume that if a kid is brought to you, they are brought to you or sent to you or you reach out to them because they are already in that group of kids that need more care, who need more um, resources. Those are the kids you need to be asking. Um, so just normalize this, bring this into your everyday language. Every time I am referred a student, um, I will say to them very clearly, I'll go to the next slide to show some examples, but I will be very clear, you know, these are the normal questions I ask. Um, so a kid is sent to you, um, or a friend reaches out to you and says, I'm worried about my friend. A parent reaches out to you, um, and just as a pause, I'm gonna go through this later, but I highly recommend if you haven't done this in your school yet, to send out some form of newsletter, some sort of email, talk to your AP about this in your department, um, to give resources to kids. And my last slide will have some resources um, so that both kids and parents know that they can be reaching out either to you or to whomever is the point person in your school that deals with mental health. If you don't have one, you need to find one. <laughs> um, even if that person is just giving referrals, um, you need a point person that's dealing with mental health in the school. Um, so somehow a student is brought to you either because someone forwarded their name, a parent reached out, a teacher reached out, the kid isn't showing up for classes a lot, and they were. Um, so I call, I do a quick hello. Um, usually I know what grade they're in, but I would say, um, you know, who do you live with? What do you like to do with friends now that we're stuck at home? You know, a little conversation. Then be very clear. Um, they were either brought to your office or the phone call is being made because you wanna discuss suicidal ideation. This is very important. Please do not say I want to discuss self-harm because self-harm is so different than suicidal ideation. Self-harm um, is not my expertise, uh, but that is cutting, pinching, um, other areas. Kids can say yes to self-harm and may be cutting themselves or pinching themselves and have no thoughts of suicide or no clear plan of suicide. So you really need to separate the two. So just be very clear. I'm making this phone call to discuss suicidal ideation. Kind of like my slide a few times ago. It's okay to be talking about it. Kids can handle it, I promise you. Um, share why. Something was posted online. Um, a friend reached out. Um, make sure to not say a friend's name if they um, ask you not to share a name. Though I will tell you something very interesting about high schoolers. And a study, I, I, had, I had noticed this and then I read a study about this and I was like, oh, I love that this was proven. Um, ninth and 10th graders are very ambivalent to share their name when someone has come to them or if they have read something that a kid is suicidal and they just feel like, you know, they have to keep it on the DL and they don't wanna, you know, be non-trusting and so much insecurity comes up. Whereas 11th and 12th graders are like, I don't care, yeah, I wanna save my friend's life. I'm fine about this. There's such a difference in confidence level in that. Um, I think you will find this with the kids you're working with that you'll see the difference between 9th and 10th and 11th and 12th. Middle school is not 
you know, middle school is a little different with that. They're probably a little more like the ninth and 10th graders. So again, don't share a name, but share them how you found out. You know, this is all about transparency. And then you're gonna go through and you're gonna ask them some questions about their thoughts of suicide. Um, I'm gonna go through all the next steps of how to go through suicide, uh, the intervention steps, uh, but I would like to pause and see if there are any questions right now and then I'll answer them and then we'll go to those next steps. Great, thanks Jess. I, I do see one question came in in the chat and if anybody else has some, you know, feel free to put them in there. Um, the question is, what happens when, um, a, uh, when a teenage family member who tries um, uh, to, who attempts suicide, how can you help a teenager who has been diagnosed with severe depression? So a fairly general question about um, helping yeah. a teenage family member. And we might get into some of this in a second. We need to... uh, I'm a little confused if Maria can just write more to this. Does she mean that the, a family member, a family member dies by suicide or tries to commit suicide or the teenager does? Maria, if you Maria could write that. clarify that at all. Yeah. Um, but what I will let you know is I'm going, the teenager does. I'm going to go through all those steps. So if there is a suicide attempt, I'm going to go through the steps of how to do that. Um, and that's the next part. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll keep going. Yeah. yeah, I don't see any other questions coming in at this point. Right. So, yep. Okay. Um, so what I like to use at my school, um, again, this is not the only suicide screening tool. I just tend to find this one to be useful, um, is the Columbia uh, Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Um, and it, there is a specific one, if you Google this, which is triage points for schools. So it's very specific, the questions that they ask for school counselors, clinicians, whomever is the one who does the assessment in school. Um, what you will find with this, again, with the normalizing of this, is that I have yet to ask a kid who's brought to me for any mental health issues, you know, even just some, you know, depression. Uh, I, I have yet to have someone answer the first question um, with an absolute no. So have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? So you sit with the kids and you bring out these questions and have it be more conversation-like, even though you're going through, but you know, still ask them. Most kids have said to me, yes, um, even if it's in such a passive way of, I had a crappy day today, I wish I wouldn't wake up. Um, and that's okay, that is not a 911 call. Um, you go to the next steps with this. Um, and then the next question is, have you had any actual thoughts of killing yourself? Um, if they say yes, then you go to the next section. If they say no, then what you do, and you'll see on the next page, is you do a behavioral health referral. Um, so you make sure to find, and I'm gonna go through the steps of how to make referrals, um, but absolutely you make a referral, you tell the parents you're making a referral. Um, this is up to you and your school and the rules of where you work, whether or not you share that you were assessing them for thoughts of suicide. Um, usually if a kid is very, 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 very passive and just saying, yeah, you know, one day I got a crappy grade on a test and I didn't want to wake up, that to me doesn't feel like I need to call a parent and say, your child, because they're not suicidal. Um, but I do say very clearly, um, and this is important. I say very clearly, um, I call them, I say very clearly, your child needs therapy. I give them the name and actually now during COVID, because so many kids need therapy, there are long, long wait lists for most of the clinics I refer to because most of our families are Medicaid. Um, so I tell parents, 
that there are um, long wait lists, I give them resources and the kids resources for chat lines and phone banks to call, phone lines to call to speak with any clinicians until they get the appointment. And then I ask for parents to please follow up with me on the date and time and name of the clinician. Um, I don't need to be collaborating with these clinicians because these are not my high risk kids. I just need to know they're in therapy. Um, okay, so if the student says for number two, have you had any actual thoughts of killing yourself? Yes. Okay, let's go to the next section, which is, have you been thinking about how you may do this? So this is the plan part. Um, the example here, I thought about taking an overdose, but I never made a specific plan as to where or when or how, and or they would say, and I would never go through with it. So they've, they've thought about the ideation, they've, they've thought about the means by which they would follow through with the ideation. Um, so you go to the next question, which is, have you had any thoughts um, on acting on this? If they say no, then you stay in the orange zone, which is they've thought about a plan, but they have no thoughts of actually wanting to move forward with it. Um, then you go, and this is both um, a behavioral health referral. Um, I would reach out and make sure that the kid can kind of, um, it depends on the city you live in. There are ways to get a kid on the head of a wait list. Um, and I will go through that a little later. Sometimes it's worth calling mobile crisis. Sometimes it's worth, uh, please don't quote me on this, but sometimes it's worth um, sending a child to an emergency room because you know they won't get admitted, but they will get an appointment within a next week to, um, an outpatient clinic. This is how it works in New York. Um, and you definitely, definitely have to write a safety plan with a kid. Um, safety plans, I personally don't believe there's one that is better than another. Uh, just Google suicide adolescent safety plan. Um, they just talk about who to contact, how to contact them, and then some coping skill methods to go through. Um, again, with the orange, I would really dig and you know see are you having any of these actual in you know intentions of moving forward with it because if they at all move into the red then keep working through the red and I'll go through more questions um, don't rely on the orange if any bit if you get any feeling in your stomach that they're answering just to answer the way they think you want to hear it keep asking, keep asking about, you know, not just an overdose ask, have you ever thought about jumping in front of a train? You, you can go through examples because again, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be like, oh, wow, my social worker said to jump in front of a train. No, kids who live in New York City have thought about that, you know, and kids who live in other parts of the country, they have areas they've thought of. Um, so now we go, so, so let's say the student you're working with, have you thought about how you might do this? Yeah, I actually have thought about it. Um, kind of like the first kid, I've been feeling really awful with my mom working as um, in the hospital, and I've thought about going to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and then you say, have you had these thoughts and have you had some intention on acting on them? Um, Yes, when my mom is working and my brother is driving me nuts and I think about how if my mom dies, I will be the sole person in charge financially of the house and I can't go to college because um, she'll have died and my brother needs me and my life is going to be over. So yeah, I have thought about that. And then you say, have you started to work out or have worked out details of how you would kill yourself? Um, stop at that part, don't go to the next part. And, and yes, I've actually thought about going to the Brooklyn Bridge. It's pretty easy, you climb up, you can jump off. Again, these are stories I have heard. So this is, I'm not just making this up. Um, and then you say, do you intend to carry out this plan? Um, not today, today's a good day. We'll see about tomorrow. 
such a red flag. We'll see about tomorrow. Um, and then I go, you know, and you take that note. Have you ever done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to take your life? Um, I have had kids, not in this exact case, but I have had kids who have given away their laptop, who have written letters to their parents apologizing for causing the stress that they've caused in their family. Um, I had a child recently, um, this was not, this was pre-COVID, but who actually brought pills in their bag um, to my office and said, you know, I was gonna take these, but I thought I should come to your office and show you. Um, it does not matter the affect of the child. Um, this could be a calm, sweet child in my office. If someone brings in their method, their method by which they would die by suicide, um, you must have them evaluated in the hospital. Because had they brought in a gun, you would immediately do that. There is no reason just because it's pills and they didn't take it doesn't mean, you know, they brought the means, the method. So you absolutely have them evaluated. Um, so have you done any of this to end your life? Have you come up with any plan? You go through that. Um, and then if they say yes, that they've come up with some form of a plan. So this suicide assessment says within the past three months, um, I leave this up to the clinician to decide if a child three months ago had a clear intent and things have been fine for the past three months and they're feeling very different. I personally don't feel you need to call 911 and have them immediately go to the hospital. This seems a little more orangey to me. Um, to absolutely get them into therapy, call the parents, have the parents on board with all of the steps. Um, and one thing that's really important about the orange, and I'm gonna go into this, actually I'm gonna wait a second. So, um, so with, with all of the clear steps, if this child has clear ideation, clear plan, they do not have any detail of what would stop them from moving forward with this plan, this is a child you absolutely want evaluated in the emergency room. Um, this is important. I'm the only clinician in my school. I sometimes need a second set of ears. And I really believe clinicians should use a second set of ears um, when you do feel a little unsure about whether to send a child or not. Um, I work very closely with Bellevue Hospital, which is um, a hospital in New York City. They have something called a child CPAP. Not all hospitals have this. A child CPAP is the child psychiatry emergency room, um, where it's psychiatrists, social workers that deal mostly with suicidal ideation and attempts. Um, I call them, hey, it's Jess from Stuyvesant. I need to go through a case. And it's really great to relay this information to someone else. Um, if you don't have a hospital worker you're as close with, find another clinician, but just don't have it all hanging on you. It's too much to have hanging all on you. Um, so if you are doing orange or yellow, which are the referrals, um, make sure in the referrals, and this all goes back to the cultural um, humility, Make sure they are appropriate for the family. Make sure they are appropriate to the culture of the family. Um, but make sure the kid goes there. Never know, family, friends will never know, it's private. Um, and just make sure that they know that this is really um, important. I personally say in my school, because there have been too many situations where people have not moved forward with therapy, um, that this is mandated. 
it's not legally mandated, but I mandate it and I feel okay with that. And you as clinicians can mandate that as well. Follow up with the family. If it is a suicidal child and they do not move forward with um, the therapy, this can also be an ACS CPS case. So um, know that you have that resource as well. It's not my go-to, but it is a resource. Um, so the interventions. When you're talking to these kids, always make sure to feel them, make them feel comfortable, make sure they are um, trusting of you when you're going through everything. Um, hospitalizations can be very, very tough for families, which is why when I do hospitalize a child, I am so clear about every step of what the hospitalization will be with both the child, the parent, um, one thing that's really important with a hospitalization, and I'm, I say this to the kid, you are gonna be asked to repeat this story 10 times, so just know this. Um, it's gonna be annoying to you, but you're gonna have to keep repeating it. Um, I personally call 911 for the majority of my cases because I have had too many times in my school where parents actually do not bring a child to the emergency room. This is school dependent. Some schools do not allow you to call 911 and they want you to have the parent bring a letter to the hospital explaining what happened in the school. Um, I always call the hospital first um, because I just wanna make sure they go at the times I don't call 911. Um, and I also call the hospital first to make sure the hospital hears my side of what happened um, and what the kid told me because sometimes in the car or in if the parent is in an ambulance, um, parents may tell a child, you know, please don't share all of this. Um, this has happened too many times. Um, so I really believe it's very important for you, you know, get a HIPAA, but share this information. Um, Post-hospitalization, I'm gonna go back for one second. So a child is hospitalized. Um, I believe in keeping close contact with the hospital, keeping close contact with the family, um, know when the child is going to come back to the school, um, get HIPAAs so that you can have permission to tell teachers not why they were in the hospital, although teachers usually know if the social worker or school counselor says a kid was in the hospital, it's because it was for mental health reasons. Um, but reintegration is so important. So you wanna make this process um, just as smooth and clean as possible. And I say this because studies show that if kids have um, difficulty with reintegration, back into school post-hospitalization, they are at a high risk of being re-hospitalized um, and needing long-term care, for, for acute care for an emergency and then longer-term care. Whereas if you make this as smoothly as possible, the hope is it can you know, keep a child from being re-hospitalized. Um, so before the discharge from the hospital, um, contact the inpatient social worker, find out the name and the date of the appointment and where the after the outpatient care is going to take place. Put that in your notes so that you can follow up with the therapist just to know that the kid is going to therapy. I have too many times that a kid is hospitalized and um, does not have aftercare. And again, it's a high risk time. Um, I always have, number two, I always have parents and guardians and the student come meet with me before starting class the first day um, for two reasons. One, I've sometimes been the bad guy who has called 911. So, you know, I want to let them know I was doing this because I care about them and like, let's mend this a little bit. Um, two, I want the kid to see me. I want the kid to know that even though we may have only had one quick interaction that hospitalized them, I am now their point person in school. Um, if you are an administrator, find a point person in your school for a kid to be working with post-hospitalization because that relationship is key to keep a child from being re-hospitalized. Um, the first week back, I have 
a child meet with me once a day, every single day. Even if it's to come in, hey Jess, I'm doing okay. Okay, great. Or if it's, hey, this sucks, I'm feeling so overwhelmed, I missed so much work, kids are wondering why I was gone, I don't know what to tell them, they have you as the point person. So every single day for that first week back, have them check in with you. It doesn't have to be long sessions, it just has to be check-ins. Um, after the daily check-ins, require weekly check-ins. So once a week they come in, hey, I'm here, I'm safe, um, it's not a therapy session because they have a therapist. So you don't have to be their therapist. You just have to be their check-in. Um, I do this for the kid. I also do this for myself because it makes me feel better to know they're safe. Um, again, consistent contact with teachers because you will find some kids will start, um, you know, especially in COVID, you know, in the remote learning, um, not really jumping back into class, not being as integrated into things. Any of these behavioral changes, this is, you need to know this, you need to speak to their therapist, you need to be checking on them. So this kind of, you know, I say always collaborative care for these kids. Um, everyone needs to be on board with this. Um, again, collaboration is vital. So um, you need all the people involved working as a team, the hospital staff, the outside therapist, teachers, family, and the student, all part of the reintegration. Um, with the cultural humility, again, this is vital because with certain families, the shame affiliated with it, um, you need to know their stories. If a kid had a suicide attempt because of issues with the parents, um, please make sure they're also getting family therapy. Please make sure to relay this to the hospital so that they are given the referral for the family therapy. In New York, we have something called HBCI, Home-Based Crisis Intervention, that is family therapy. Um, there are a lot of resources. Know your city, know what resources they have. Um, Best outreach methods during COVID-19. Uh, student surveys have been phenomenal for us. Um, kids are reaching out and saying that they are doing well or not well. Um, make a quick Google survey, send it out to your whole student body. Um, we have weekly counseling department newsletters where we are putting out coping skills group. Um, and then in every single um, new, and then things to do at home, ways to be integrated, things to watch on TV, you know, just like a fun newsletter. But in it, every single time is one section that highlights resources to use if you are not doing well. Um, and I'm gonna go through those resources. I run a coping skills group. I, I think the title or something is like, being at home sucks, you know, and the kids love it because for them it really does suck. Um, they are really not enjoying this. So it's fun. Every week we do a coping skills group, how to get through this. And um, the kids like that. So I recommend if you have the time to do a coping skills group. Um, the last thing is the parent newsletter. Um, again, for our population, English is not the primary language. So we make sure it's in many languages. Normalizing, normalizing, normalizing. Um, that there are a lot of mental health uh, implications during COVID. There are anyway, but especially during COVID, so depression, anxiety, ideation. If you normalize this for the parents, then they know they can call you for resources. I have made more referrals for therapy during COVID than I ever have because families need this. Um, so referrals. In New York City, we have an amazing listserv where you just put in your neighborhood. Um, I don't know other states as much, and I apologize about this. We also have mobile crisis in New York. New Jersey, I spoke to a colleague of mine. Um, there is mobile crisis in New Jersey. You're supposed to contact New Jersey Perform Care, um, and they will, they will give you the appropriate numbers to call depending on the district that you're in. Uh, know in your state who to be calling because there it doesn't just go 
you know, you don't always want to call 911. There are many steps before that. So you just make sure to know where the therapeutic resources are. Um, the Trevor Project is phenomenal for the LGBTQAI population. Um, again, high risk groups. So please be making regular referrals for those kids anyway. I personally believe everyone should be in therapy because therapy is fantastic and it's great to just have a place to, you know, process, including clinicians. So clinicians do referrals for yourselves as well. Um, and finally, in New York, we are very lucky to have the child psychiatry emergency rooms. This is not across the board. Um, many states do not have this. What I think is most important to do is by your school, there is a hospital. Call the hospital, ask to speak to the ER doctor, the ER social worker, become familiar. I know my people at Bellevue, I am very close to them. I know my people at Elmhurst, at Mount Sinai. I, I know the people who I can call to go through a case. I know the people I can follow up with cases. Having these personal relationships to do true collaborative care makes the difference with saving kids' lives. I really, really, really promise that is um, knowing a face-to-face -face or even a phone-to-phone -phone will change the level of care a kid will get. And that's it. <laughs> um, again, this is a hard time. We as clinicians in schools, um, we've been thrown a tremendous amount of work um, that we were not really trained. We were not all trained in how to work from our homes and be trying to help high-risk kids in who are many miles from us and do this over the phone. So um, I know it's hard and I also know that using these resources where you're regularly asking the kids who are referred to you if they're having thoughts of suicide, um, and getting the right referrals and resources to them um, and just getting it out in the open in every newsletter, in every survey, um, this will save lives. So um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Here's my information and um, I look forward to some questions now. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Jess. Um, yeah, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the question um box there was one question that i think would be um fairly quick for you to answer then i have a question that i want to ask as well could you share um there was a question about whether or not you would be willing to share your survey and sample weekly newsletter with the group i i did not write those so i can't share them and okay. i apologize okay. it's just that was my colleague who wrote them but i yep. will say the questions in the survey it really was short are you having any mental health issues are you and then in a scale of one to four um okay. and then the threes and the fours they were sent to me and i sent referrals to them are you in okay. are you in therapy yes or no do you want a referral to therapy yes or no so just ask the basic questions of keeping it simple yeah and not about suicide yeah. this is not that it's just saying do you need some support yeah okay great thank you um, Jess, I had a question because I, I felt like a lot of uh, a theme that ran throughout your presentation was about this idea of normalization, mm -hmm. normalizing, normalizing, normalizing. And um, I wondered about this idea of during COVID-19 in particular, um, you mentioned that we're, we're dealing with per, this pervasive issue of kind of death being front and center, the possibility of getting sick or people that we love getting sick and dying, increased depression, anxiety, things like that. Um, what, what have you seen that like, I guess, helps with some of the normalization around those conversations, around difficult topics generally, suicide being one of them, obviously. But I, I have a sense, you know, working with people in schools and other spaces that there is often a lot of fear. And, and I know this for a fact, working in the field of bereavement, there's a lot of fear to talk about death and dying and there's a lot of fear around suicidality there's a lot of fear around depression so could you just maybe give some general i guess guidance or tips for just normalizing those conversations shifting uh, some of those dynamics to, to help a, students yeah. feel more open that's a fantastic question what i and it's reminding me of um a workshop i was giving in the beginning of the year for parents of every grade level um i think 
because a school is a system and a child is part of a family system, you want to get each part of that system. So with the parents, normalizing that high school in general, middle school in general, being a kid in general is tough. Um, we are in a complicated world. And so just letting parents know in entering every new grade, things will come up. Um, know the population you're working with. Again, for the school I work with, we tend to have a lot of anxiety rather than depression being leading those to more high risk behaviors. Um, so I really normalize that anxiety is something like, you know, get therapy, get treatment for the anxiety, learn the skills. Um, and with depression, COVID aside, you know, in adolescence, there is such um, a pervasive issue of increased depression, anxiety, you know, eating disorders, yep. um, you know, uh, addiction. A lot of these things start in adolescence. So just kind of getting it out to parents and relaying to parents and kids. But this is something that, you know, you can expect. Again, kind of going back to the suicide with suicidal ideation, one in six has had serious thoughts. So talk about normalizing. I mean, this is something kids are thinking about. So if that's just suicide, imagine what percentage of kids are just kind of having, you know, a range of a crappy day to feeling really, you know, pervasive depression. Um, and just getting it out there that that's okay and it's not stigmatized. My, my AP says all the time, um, you know, if you had a cold, if you broke your leg, all of this, you would immediately go to a doctor to help mend you. Yes. Why do we feel any different about mental health? You need help. You need some support and that's fine. Yep. I also, with the normalizing, I do like to say to families and to kids, it is confidential. And I know someone asked me that question as well with the confidentiality. Uh, confidentiality but, like, I, but, like I do, but I do think it's important for people to know before they enter into any kind of treatment, it is confidential. Yeah. Um, so with the idea of resources for confidentiality um, and running virtual groups. I'm curious, Judy, if you're in a school or not. I think in school, in schools, I'm answering this, I should know this, but I might be making this up and I'm just telling you this, but. Um, uh, Judy said yes, Judy is Yes, in, in schools. School. Okay, you can run groups in schools. At least in New York City, you can run groups. Um, if a child expresses any uh, suicidal thoughts, um, you know, that always is a rule that you can break confidentiality. Homicidal or suicidal thoughts, you can always, always, always break confidentiality. Um, in those groups, uh, yeah, you can run groups too, yeah. In schools, you can run groups. Um, it's, it's in the school day, it's allowed. In, in counseling departments, our school counselors do that. Um, and yes, there is the concern of someone else being in the room and, we can't control everything. This yeah, is the world yeah. we're mean, in. We're running virtual groups and that's, you know, we, we suggest put in earphones and make sure that the groups have passwords on them and all those things. Encourage kids to find a quiet private place, but there's only so much that you can control. Yeah. And I will say a lot of the clinical work that's happening right now, kids are having a very hard time that they're close to their families with this. Yeah. And yep. we're just figuring out ways to get the information out there. And um, kids with developmental disabilities and mental health, um, that is not my area. Um, but I know, I don't know what city you're in. I know in NYC Well, you can look it up and um, they will give resources for that. But I, I don't know across the board, I'm sorry. Um, um. Jess, I'm just being attentive to time, and yeah. I would encourage people, because I, I think we should move toward wrapping it up. Um, I would encourage people, if they do have more questions, feel free to re reach out. You see Jess's contact information there. Um, the last thing I'm going to plug is, please, 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 I do have a, a survey for this webinar. You'll see it in an automated email. I just put it into the chat. If you would just fill out that survey, let us know about your experience. If you have any questions for me or other um, upcoming workshops or resources related to good grief, there's my email in the chat as well. Um, any last um, words, Jess, before we let everybody go? 
I, my, my final words are collaboration and even reach out always to other clinicians um, to share resources and to also share if you're struggling with a case. This is nothing we have to do alone. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, Jess, thank you so much for sharing with us your expertise and experience. I think we are all better for it. Um, and a really great word today to normalize these conversations with our students, to be willing to step into these uncomfortable spaces in order to support them through um, both this difficult time that we're in now, but also the difficult times that a lot of our students are facing on a daily basis. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And everybody, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Hope to see you at a future webinar um, and stay healthy and stay safe, everybody. Thank you.